series. Um, my name is Charles Dwan. I am a fellow with the um, American University Washington College of Law's uh, program on information justice and intellectual property. Um, we've been running the series to talk about um, folks who work in the public interest space on patent policy. Um, and you know, looking at some of the issues that they're, they're working on, some of the big topics in patent policy today, and also um, talking about what careers in this space look like. And um, for those students who are interested in going to this space, how, um, how you can become a, a public interest advocate um, in, in, in this, I think, very unique and very interesting space. Um, today, I'm glad to be joined by my, my friend and colleague, Josh Landau. Uh, Josh is patent counsel at the Computer and Communications Industry Association. Um, he, previously was a, he previously was a staffer in Congress and also practiced patent law. Um, so welcome, Josh. Thanks for having me. Um, so you know, I'm delighted to um, to, to have you here. Um, I think that you're the you're the first uh, trade association person, um, and so I'd love to hear a little bit about kind of what the background is of CCIA, kind of where its history is, and how patents fit into the work that you're doing there. Yeah, so CCIA formed about 50 years ago um, as the Computer and Communications and History Association back then as well, and our members have changed over the years, but generally they're companies in the sort of Computing and communication space writ broadly. So our current members include a lot of companies you've heard of, companies like Apple and Google, or Samsung and Facebook. They also include companies you may not have heard of, although given the the interest group here, you might have companies like Cloudflare, companies that are behind internet infrastructure that are maybe not as publicly facing, but are still in that sort of communication space. And what we do is we represent the interests of our members um, that can include anything from amicus work or notice and comment work, especially in front of, at least for me, the patent office. It can also include going to the Hill or going to the administration and talking to people. And it can include uh, speaking in public. Last week, I was at uh, the Federal Circuit Bar Association event on a panel about um, disinformation and misinformation and patent policy. So that's sort of the, the scope of what I do. The scope of CCIA as a whole is whatever is of interest to our members. Um, a lot of the issues that we talk about are things around content moderation, intermediary liability, privacy, competition issues. Um, fortunately, we have people who are experts in all of those fields because I am certainly not. My expertise is very much in the, the patent space. Yeah, I think you know it's it's a really interesting portfolio that the um, that the organization overall has. Um, you know, one of the things that I know about CCA is that it has a particular interest in sort of competition issues. It was obviously very um, very involved in the the Microsoft antitrust case um, back in the day, um, and you know still um, you know does some really fantastic work um, with like the Federal Trade Commission on, on competition issues in the technology space. Um, how do you see competition as sort of playing a role in um, in patent policy, and kind of where do you where do you see that um, that that intersection? Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, patents are an anti-competitive tool. We think they are worth it to have that anti-competitive effect, but they do have an effect on competition. They are saying that either your competitors cannot do this or that if they do it, they have to pay you. And that does distort the, the competitive marketplace. The idea behind intellectual property is that there is a reward for uh, having these anti-competitive effects, that they're it is worth having these because it promotes innovation writ more broadly and it's worth giving these temporary monopolies over. But it's hard to, to disentangle the competitive effects. It also plays in more directly, and I think um, you already had somebody talk about this, but in the standard space with standard essential patents and FRAND, obviously competition issues come in there even more strongly because not only do you have the right to exclude people, but you have an entire industry getting together and agreeing between themselves, here's what we want to do. Here's the technology we want to use. Here's who's the patents that we're going to require anybody making this product to license. That is a cartel. I mean, in competition law, that would be illegal, except that there's so much benefit from standardization that we say, well, we'll let it go in this instance. But there are also protections that are built into the, the standard setting process, typically a, a FRAND requirement, 
that are they come out of competition law. They don't they didn't arrive whole heart uh, out of whole cloth. They were formed from competitive issues and decisions in the Supreme Court and elsewhere about what it means to have competition and how we can avoid anti-competitive effects when we're still allowing uh, when we're still allowing a standards cartel to form and provide us with its benefits. So I think it's very hard to think about patents without thinking about their competitive effects. Yeah, so you know, I think that there are lots and lots of really interesting, um, interesting kind of disputes that have come up um, on these questions of patents and competition, just because of the fact that you know there are lots and lots of these um, folks who are involved in lot at, at different levels in terms of the companies and in terms of the um, the the sort of stakeholder involved, uh, stakeholders involved. Now, one of the interesting things about patents, of course, is that there are many places in which those disputes can come up. Um, and I know that a big focus of your work has been looking at these sorts of you know jurisdictional issues. Um, agency issues, questions about where patents can be, um, where patents can be disputed, and where patent policy can be disputed. Um, you know, can you can you give us sort of a, a a lay of the land or an overview of kind of what the space looks like? Yeah. So I mean, I think just starting with the U.S. So we'll we'll set aside all of the other possible places to dispute things elsewhere. But in the U.S., you have the courts, obviously. You have the ITC, which is the most active patent court in the country, even if people don't always think of it that way. And the ITC is the International Trade Commission. You also have uh, the Patent Office, where a limited set of the disputes are brought out, particularly invalidity disputes and occasionally ownership disputes. So those are the three main buckets. Then within the district courts, obviously, you have different district courts. You have the, the two districts in Texas, West Texas and East Texas. And when we talk about both of those, we should really talk about the Waco Division and the Marshall-Tyler Divisions because that's where the cases go. You don't see a ton of cases getting filed in El Paso or Austin, despite the, the tech presence in Austin. You see them go to the courts that have made themselves appealing to patent plaintiffs. And that is Waco with Judge Albright and Tyler and Marshall with Judge Gilstrap and uh, before him, Judge Ward and Judge Davis. So there's a little bit longer history in, uh, in East Texas. You also have Delaware which after TC Heartland took over a, a significant role because you can pretty much always sue people in Delaware because most of them are incorporated there. And then the Northern District of California has a, a significant docket because of its tech presence in the same way that like the District of New Jersey has a significant pharma docket because of the pharmaceutical presence over there. That doesn't mean there aren't other courts, but those are kind of the, the big ones, those in CD Cal. Yeah, it's a it's it's a very complicated landscape, Mom. Lots and lots of different choices. Um, so yes, so last week um, at our previous session, when we talked with Joe Mullen of EFF, he talked a little bit about some of you know the the jurisdictional issues in courts, particularly about the Eastern District of Texas, how that became somewhat infamous as a um, as a, as a patent jurisdiction. But you mentioned also the the Patent Office, the USPTO, and the International Trade Commission. Um, and those two, I think, are kind of are, are going to be kind of new to a lot of folks. Uh, can you talk about you know just kind of what they are and what the you know what what are the questions that people are talking about um, in terms of in terms of those administrative agencies as places of patent yeah. disputes? So at the PTO, the big dispute uh, or the big dispute venue is the PTAB, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. And what is happening there is that uh, typically uh, an alleged infringer. This is usually associated with litigation or pre-litigation activity. This doesn't tend to happen just at random. Uh, the alleged infringer will go in and say, I don't think this patent is valid and file what's called a petition for inter partes review. They'll list the reasons why they'll provide their prior art. They'll provide an expert declaration from somebody with a, a scientific background in the field explaining here is why this patent we don't think is valid. Patent owner files a response and then the PTAB will assign a panel of judges of three judges to decide, should we hear this case? If they met the initial threshold question of, is it reasonably likely that at least one claim is invalid? If they've met that threshold, the PTO can institute the proceeding. They're not required to, but they may, and proceed forward to decide, should these claims be maintained or should they be invalidated? That's the, the short version of what's going on there. There are huge questions about the discretionary authority of the patent office to choose whether or not to hear these cases, um, even if they have a, 
even if there's a showing on the merits that yes, this probably is invalid, the patent office has maintained that it has the right to deny institution for other reasons. There are arguments about what reasons are acceptable, what reasons should be acceptable, but that's the a big one right now. There have also been a lot of arguments about sort of the procedures to be followed, what interpretation standards we should use for claims, should how much amendment should the patentee be perform, uh, allowed to perform. So there are sort of subsidiary disputes, but a lot of it is just should these cases be heard? And we've seen several um, non-patent law attacks on the PTAB at the Supreme Court, in particular the oil states case and the um, Arthrex case, and to a lesser extent SAS. And those were not about sort of the patent law side of things. They were more about administrative law and constitutional structural issues with how the agency set things up. But at the back, they were attacked by people who thought that the PTAB shouldn't exist, or at least not IPR. So that I think is sort of the, the gist of the PTAB. I don't know if you want to talk about a little more there before I move on to the ITC <laughs> or... Um, yeah, so, so, you know, I think it's, it's, it's great. And, you know, particularly the fact that, you know, you, you've noted the, the sort of administrative law backing um, to a lot of these questions. Um, I, guess, I guess just, you know, kind of what's, what's your take on kind of, um, you know, why these things are so disputed and, you know, what, what's the right way to, to go forward um, in, terms of the, in terms of the PTAB, in terms of the patent office's ability to, um, to, to, deal with, um, to, to, to deal with these patent challenges? I mean, honestly, when you ask why these things are disputed, I, I think the answer is real simple. It's money. These are valuable patents. They wouldn't be at the PTAB if they weren't. Uh, you know, filing a, an IPR is cheaper than going into litigation to invalidate a patent, but it's not cheap. You're still looking at anywhere from sort of 200000 up to a million dollars to file and prosecute through to the end a petition on one patent. That's not something you do for fun generally. Uh, that's a, a lot of money. So they're spending it when the patent threatens a significant revenue stream for the the alleged infringer or when there is some other associated reason. But it really it comes down to money and the people who have patents don't want to lose them because they make them money. And the people who think those patents shouldn't have been granted don't want to pay them money for patents they think shouldn't have been granted. So that's the the root of this dispute is uh, you know, sort of an ordinary commercial I don't want to pay you for something I shouldn't have to pay you for. And then in terms of kind of like the work that you've done and the folks that you work with, what do you, what do you think are kind of like the key, the key considerations um, in terms of, you know, what's the right policy moving forward with, uh, um, with the PTAB and with this, with this process? So I think, um, and tying it to the, the actual topic of this uh, series, the public mm -hmm. interest, I think that one of the things that we should be considering, and I think the, the, the new director, Director Vidal, has done a good job of bringing this in as she's looked at some of the things that the previous director did, is that above all else, the patent office should not be leaving enforced patents that aren't valid. There might be you know, uh, prudential reasons that in a particular case, a particular party might not want, might not be a good party to have involved, I'm thinking of the recent um, Open Sky and VLSI mm -hmm. petition, where there is pretty good evidence, it looks like, I mean, from the, the outside looking in here, it looks like there's pretty good evidence that the original petitioner was not doing this for good reasons, and that they were trying to abuse the system. It also looks like the patents aren't valid. So finding the right balance between making sure the system isn't abused but also making sure that the public doesn't have to put up with an invalid patent that it shouldn't have to put up with. That's, I think, a lot of the, the balance that we've tried to strike is how do we get at a system that's going to be effective, that's going to be useful and usable, but isn't going to leave patents in force that shouldn't be in force. Yeah, I, and I think that ties very much into the conversation we had in in our first session with uh, with, with Abby, uh, who talked about kind of what the costs of these um, low quality patents are when they're allowed to kind of remain out there. Um, so you know, I think that that's a that's an important public policy consideration that you brought up. Um, now, you know, turning to the International Trade Commission, this is an agency that a lot of people haven't heard of, and particularly haven't heard of in the context of patents. Um, so can I, can you talk a little bit about kind of where they fit in and what are the what are the issues that are that are surrounding that? That agency these days. So I think um, just to preface all of this, the committee of jurisdiction in the House on the ITC is House Ways and Means. 
I've gone into meetings with Houseways and Maine staffers and tried to explain to them the problems with the ITC and they've gone, wait, we have an agency that handles patent disputes? I didn't know that. And this is the committee that's supposed to be providing oversight. So it isn't just surprising to you. It's surprising to people who should know. Uh, the International Trade Commission was formed in the early 20th century, I want to say. I'd have to go back and look at the history to be exact. But the idea was that it, it's protectionist. It's that there is foreign unfair competition, and we shouldn't let products made through unfair competition into our country. That has been defined to include pat, uh, products that were made in violation of U.S. patents or products that would violate a U.S. patent in operation. And that is where the patent aspect of the ITC comes in. But it's become a more and more utilized uh, forum, in particular after the eBay decision, because after eBay, it becomes harder, not impossible, but harder, especially if you're a non-practicing entity, to get an injunction in the United States on a patent, unless it, there's really a competitive harm to the patent owner. The ITC only has one remedy, and that remedy is exclusion of product from the United States. It's being able to say, you cannot bring your product across the border. So if you manufacture in the United States, you actually do have a, an advantage in that the ITC isn't going to be able to touch your products, though they might be able to touch the uh, the uh, source components that are coming in from outside of the United States. If you don't manufacture in the United States, the ITC has the power to block your entire product based on one patent, which maybe at one point made sense. Uh, there's a, a letter that was read into the record in the of oh, the 30s, I want to say, and this was in the context of damages, but it was between two very prominent patent lawyers of the time. And what they basically said is, you know, this rule might have made sense back when a patent basically covered one big product and we were patenting, I don't know, like a wheelbarrow. Not that that was the actual patent, but simple products that are not complex that maybe have one or two patents. You know, the estimate was uh, a decade ago, the estimate was that for a phone, you're looking at that's blinking in and out, uh, about 250,000 patents, but that was a decade ago. A decade before that, the estimate was about 70,000 patents that cover a phone. Now, you know, 250,000 a decade ago, 70,000 20 years ago, what do we think the number is at now? I'm guessing it's higher. And that, yeah, you know, the idea that one of those 250,000 or more patents could actually pull the entire product off the market that's concerning. Um, that sort of subverts the eBay decision. It runs serious risks of over-rewarding patent holders for technology that they didn't uh, have anything to do with, for value they didn't create. So there are real concerns about that. This is supposed to be counterbalanced by ITC by a literal public interest requirement. The ITC is supposed to consider the public interest and say, well, should we actually exclude these products from the country? Is it in the public interest to do so? In practice, the question is almost always answered with, yes, it is in the public interest to do this, um, partially because the ITC has taken a very pro-IP view, and partially because there isn't a lot of emphasis given to the public interest inquiry. That's been changing slowly, and there are efforts, efforts to change it more. But just as one example, there is a piece of statutory text in the ITC's uh, organic statute that says the ITC shall, the commission shall consult with a list of agencies and such other agencies as they feel are appropriate. They don't do this and they admit they don't do this. Their consultation, and this came up in a federal circuit argument uh, a few weeks ago, last month, recently in a Philip Morris case where they said, no, we don't, you know, the FDA is on this list of agencies, but we consult with them by putting out a notice for public comment. And the judges did not sound like they felt that was really uh, what the words shall consult with are supposed to mean. It's shall consult with and seek advice and information from is the full thing. So you have to really, the I, I would argue and have argued that they have to do more, that they have to go out to these agencies and talk to them. The PTO is not listed, but you have to think, especially if you have a patent where the PTO is conducting a validity review through an IPR, and the ITC is looking at the infringement side of things, you would think it would be relevant to the ITC to go talk to the PTO, to go talk to the APJs working on that case and say, what do you think about validity here? This is not something they do. So the ITC 
could do a lot better at actually considering the public interest. And then maybe we'd see more than four exclusion orders denied on the public interest grounds over the past, I don't know, 40 years at this point. Yeah, that's really interesting that, you know, the ITC has um, a statutory requirement to think about the public interest, but how they implement that, um, you know, how they work with other agencies to figure out what the, you know, what the relevant public interest considerations are, yeah. um, you know, that that's sort of a, that's sort of a need to be a, a need to be filled. Um, now, I know that you've worked a little bit on um, some some legislation to, to reform the, the ITC. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of what what, what you'd be looking at there? Yeah, so this is uh, the Advancing America's Interest Act, I think is what you're referring to, um, which is from Representatives Delbene and Schweiker. And it looks at the domestic industry requirement and the public interest requirement. Um, on the domestic industry, it tries to kind of make that a more important uh, inquiry. And domestic industry with the ITC is the idea that there has to be something that you're protecting in the US. Again, it's purely a protectionist uh, piece of legislation. If there's no U.S. industry, you're not supposed to be able to get an ITC exclusion order, which makes sense if you think about it as a, a protectionist action. Why would you protect a Swiss company from unfair foreign competition in the United States? That doesn't make sense. The problem is that the way that that has been applied and described, they include sort of like patent licensing activity as domestic industry, and that is often how people get in, or they will do what's called DI by subpoena, where they will initially go after somebody who they either think they can win against or think will settle with them cheap. They get that license, and then they point to that license when they bring ITC complaints and say, see, we're relying on our licensee for domestic industry. We're relying on what they do in the US. And often that domestic industry licensee doesn't want to be there. That's why they call it DIY subpoena, because you're dragging them into court to help out your ITC case, even though they would prefer you went away forever. Um, actually lost track of what the question was originally. <laughs> Well, so so yeah, so we're talking about the legislation. So you've talked about the um, the domestic industry aspects, but there are right, also right. amendments to the uh, to the public interest standard, right? And it's a, a pretty simple amendment, but it's also an important one. It is currently the ITC has to say we will issue an exclusion order unless it is in the public interest not to. And AAIA would basically flip that inquiry. It would say we will issue an a, a, it must be in the public interest in order to issue an exclusion. order. So you have to find that it is affirmatively in the public's interest to issue exclusion, rather than finding that it is in the public's interest not to issue exclusion, otherwise an exclusion order will issue. So it's a, a subtle change and who knows how much practical impact it would have with the current generation of ITC commissioners who are used to sort of the way the public interest has been handled to date. But going forward, it would certainly be helpful to have it be even if it's a preponderance standard, it matters which side the burden sits on. Yeah, and you know what I find so interesting about this is that these these fixes are you know seemingly very technical things. Um, you know, talking about like the, the the details of the the burden shifting with the public interest standard, I suppose, and you know this domestic industry requirement that seems to have these um, sort of unusual procedures, and yet there is this um, fairly substantial effect. On, um, on on major public interest considerations. You know, um, as you mentioned, smartphones or computers that come before the ITC where there can be hundreds of thousands or um, you know, possibly even more patents on them um, that can have real effects for individual consumers. So, you know, I think it's just it's, it's just such a such a fascinating field. Um, it's a fascinating field that you've managed to get into. So, you know, I'd love to um, to talk a little more about kind of how you got to um, how you got to your career and um, you know what it's what it's like working in this space. Um, I'd certainly invite any of the students who have questions about um, you know about about these uh, about these issues or about what a career path in the public interest looks like. Um, Mike, uh, Mike Carroll actually has yeah. a quick question here about the VLSI case. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? I think that one's really interesting. Sure, yeah. I think it is too. Um, because it really touches on so many of the current issues in patent policy. So to understand what's going on now in VLSI, we have to go back a couple of years. Intel was sued by VLSI, and I should disclose Intel is a CCIA member, so obviously... Um, there's some interest in our membership in what happens here. 
but um, today I should also clarify, I'm speaking for myself, not for CCIA. So a couple of years ago, VLSI sued Intel on a set of patents and Intel went to the patent office and said, we don't think these patents are valid. Here's our petition as to why. And what happened is that because Intel was sued in West Texas, and they'd originally been sued in Delaware, VLSI actually dropped those complaints so that they could refile in West Texas in front of Judge Albright, in particular because Judge Albright sets very rapid trial schedules. And because he sets a rapid trial schedule, what happens is you file the IPR, and under a set of uh, doctrine called Fintiv, which was put in place by the previous director, Director Yanku, if the trial is going to happen or is scheduled to happen before the PTAB would issue a decision, they won't rule on it, or they could deny institution on that basis, even if it was a meritorious petition. And that's what happened. Intel's petitions were denied, not on merits. You know, they didn't say, oh, these aren't good petitions. These patents are valid over this prior art. They said, we're just not going to look at this issue. Fast forward a couple of years, and VLSI wins a two points, depending on whether you're including interest and all that, a, a more than $2 billion verdict against Intel on these patents. At which point, a couple of entities that are newly formed that I don't know anything, you know, that no one knows anything about, Open Sky and Patent Quality Assurance, filed IPRs. And what they did was really interesting here because they IPR'd VLSI's patents and they didn't go and file a new petition. They took Intel's petition essentially verbatim. They used the same expert. They used the same declaration. They basically took Intel's petition, crossed off Intel, and wrote in Open Sky and filed those at the patent office. And given the way that Fintiv had been applied and is being applied now under Director Vidal, they weren't denied. They were instituted because there wasn't a co-pending trial. These are outside entities, at which point um, Intel could file and basically say, we wish to join these petitions now that they've been instituted through the, the AIA's joinder provision, which let them join as sort of silent understudies. So Intel is now a silent understudy on its own petition, <laughs> um, which is an interesting role to be in. Behind the scenes, it turns out that Open Sky is apparently just uh, talking to or trying to get VLSI to agree, you know, pay us some money, pay VLSI, pay Open Sky some money, and we will tank the IPR. We will stay in it. We're not going to settle. But we won't produce our expert for for deposition. We will make it so that you get a ruling that the patents are valid. VLSI completely rightly went to the PTAB and said, "This isn't right. They're you know, they're abusing the system. This is not proper behavior," which I would tend to agree with. At which point, Director Vidal pulled the whole thing out and said, "Okay, let's take a real look at this because uh, there's something going on here." She asked for discovery into communications between VLSI and Open Sky, between Open Sky and Intel to see if there was some um, arrangement between Open Sky and Intel to get Open Sky out of it so Intel could take over. And what came out is basically that Intel was not involved. Open Sky was having these discussions or trying to have these discussions with VLSI. And she decided that the appropriate sanction, and I tend to agree, we filed an amicus brief on this exact topic, is to kick Open Sky out of the process, out of the proceeding, and let Intel take the lead. Um, now, VLSI is currently complaining, oh, we're being punished, even though we didn't do anything wrong. I, I have some sympathy for that, but at the same time, these petitions should have just been heard two years ago when Intel filed them. <laughs> they should not have... Uh, this problem was caused by Fintiv, which is bad. The fact that it's been a little negative for VLSI now, I mean, I hope that they do get sanctions from Open Sky. It seems deserved. And then I hope that the IPR continues and invalidates the patents as they seem to be likely to be invalid. I mean, uh, Director Vidal went back and asked the board to determine, do these make a compelling case of unpatentability? Not just a case of unpatentability, but a compelling case. The board said yes. Director Vidal is now reviewing the board's decision to make sure she agrees, which again, I think is the right thing to do because of how valuable, because you know, there's a $2 billion judgment riding on these, because it's a very public process. I think having the director 
take an active responsibility for whatever decision comes out is the right response as well. So I think, yeah, I, I think that things are going the way they should have, um, assuming the uh, VLSI denial. Mm -hmm. I, I think the way they should have gone is that we would have just heard these with Intel as the lead petitioner before trial, but that ship has sailed. So I think in terms of the, the open sky petitions, this is in a good place. Things have happened the way they should. Yeah, and I remember that you had a um, you had a great guest post on uh, yeah it was the the one by Joe Vital that that basically explained that you know this is just the the unfortunate unintended consequence of a of a sort of overzealous approach to discretionary denials. Yeah, um, I'll put that I'll put that post into the into the chat if anybody is 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 interested in it. Um, but yeah, so so let's talk a little bit about kind of you know what it's like to work on these sorts of uh, <laughs> on these sorts of cases, um, and, and particularly. I think so. So Sharon has uh, has a great question, but um, I want so I want to get to that in just a second. But um, the the first question I wanted to ask you was just you know at a trade association where you're working with like companies like Intel, um, you know what what sort of the uh, what what sort of the, the the interactions and the processes that you have in terms of you know working with these companies, trying to develop sort of consensus views, um, trying to figure out you know what's the best policy um, when you're when you're weighing in on these debates. Like what what does that what does that yeah. sort of work? look like so every trade association works differently I, I here i'm going to describe what ccia does i know others work on different models um we are not a pure consensus trade there are some where everybody has to agree or the association won't take a petition a position we develop a position with member input if there's something that all of you know that 70 percent of our members were against we're probably not going to take that position on behalf of the 30 percent but if it's the other way around, we may, depending on what it is, say to that 30%, well, you know, we know you disagree, but this is really important to a majority of our membership. And maybe we can, you know, uh, massage the, the message a bit to address your concerns as well. But basically, it's a lot of talking to members to understand what their concerns are so that I can make good recommendations that they will be likely to accept. Um, so, you know, depending on the member, it might be I talk to them weekly. They have my cell phone number and can call me when something comes up. Um, they email me occasionally to say, hey, this thing came up. Or I, there are some members who just aren't particularly interested in patents. They join the association for other reasons. And from them, I don't hear ever. So a lot of it is building up a, an understanding of what our membership is interested in, what they would like to see happen and then working with them to drive forward some sort of uh, an action that can hopefully have an impact on that, whether that be Hill meetings, legislation, uh, amicus work, notice and comment work. So a lot of the job is sort of taking information from members about what they want and figuring out how to synthesize that into a good answer and then how to make that answer have some policy impact. You know, it's not enough to just say, this is what the answer should be. You have to try to, to execute that in some way or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so you know that it, it sounds like that's I, I'm sure that's a lot of work, just kind of like working with all of the all of the different members and getting to know them and getting to understand sort of where they're coming from and what the positions are. But it sounds like it's also just really exciting in that you get insights into you know what's going on for all of these folks kind of on the ground. Yeah, no, I, I think one of the the fun things about working in patent policy is that you get to hear um, from lots of really smart people who also really care about patents what's going on in their mind and what they think is a, a good answer. Um, and, you know, there aren't that many people in the world who want to sit over the dinner table and talk about patents, uh, for better or worse. Um, and it's nice when you have those people to be able to talk with them and to, to share that common interest. The patent policy space is not big. There aren't that many people involved. So it's a small world of people who really want to talk about these things, but it's nice to have that that world to talk about these issues that I think are really important and uh, yeah, bounce ideas off of them um, mm -hmm. as to how we can improve things. 
Yeah. Um, and so, you know, let, let's get to, to Sharon's question. Um, you know, given that you've had the chance to work with a lot of folks, um, particularly in the sort of patents and competition space, what does that landscape look like? What are those sort of organizations that work in that space? You know, what types of organizations? Um, yeah. Who else, who, like, who do you work with on, on these sorts of issues? So, I mean, there are other trade associations that I work with um, that have patent policy aspects. So like HGA, the High Tech Inventors Alliance, uh, Abby Reeves from Engine, from the sort of startup perspective, uh, Alex Moss, who you also talked to. So I think Charles is bringing in a lot of the people I talked to, but <laughs> other trades, but also the the public interest groups like EFF and Public Knowledge, um, uh, R Street, and here I'm naming off places Charles has worked. <laughs> um, so that's sort of the one side mm -hmm. of things. The companies obviously directly are part of it. There are the professional associations like AIPLA or um, IPO, which are not quite trade associations, mm -hmm. but are in a similar place, but have more sort of direct practitioner members. Um, and then there's sort of the, the hill side of things, the staffers who work on these issues. There are staffers who would prefer that they never have to talk about patents again in their life. <laughs> But there's also a small subset of members, mostly on Judiciary Committee, who have a long involvement with this. Um, Senator Leahy, sadly, is retiring at the end of the term, but he's always had somebody on staff who knows about patent issues and has been deeply involved in patent policy for his entire career. There's a, a reason it's the Leahy Smith American Events Act. Um, so that's a, another sort of component of the, the conversation. Um, I know the question was sort of competition patents in the public interest. Competition, I know there's other things out there. I just don't know enough about them to really give you a good answer. I'm sorry, Sharon. But um, in terms of patents and public interest, that's kind of the scope. Um, yeah. Um, it's, it's actually interesting. Um, you know, there are, there are a couple of folks who work at, you know, some of the, the competition focused nonprofits um, that, that I'd love to bring in at, at some point for, for a future talk. Um, so hopefully we'll have a further discussion about that. Uh, so, so Kelly has a question about VLSI, but just before we get to that, I, I wanted to briefly touch on, because you mentioned um, sort of the hill, the hill side of things and you worked on the hill for, for a while. Yeah, I was um, there for about a yeah. year. Yeah, and um, so kind of how has that experience informed you know how you go about um, a, a, about policy advocacy and the policy work you do? Um, so when I was on the Hill, I was working on privacy issues. I actually did not work on patent issues while I was there, um, although it was Judiciary Committee either way. But I think the experience I had on the Hill really informed understanding the dynamics of legislation and how these things happen. Um, and understanding both the amount of time. The other part of it is that it's really helpful to have been on the other side of the table when I'm going to go in and talk to a staffer to have an understanding of how much time they probably spent preparing for this conversation. Probably not a ton. How much time they're going to have to think about it. Also probably not a ton. How likely it is that it's going to make it up to their, uh, to their member, to their boss. Possible, um, depending on what we're talking about and what their member's interests are. So having a, a better understanding of your audience, basically, is one of the values when you're on the other side. It's a lot easier to go talk to a staffer if you've been on the, the side of those conversations and know what you didn't like. Um, yeah, and you know, I, I know that there are a lot of folks who work in the policy space who kind of came from the Hill, um, had a job working as a staffer for for a member. Um, so you know that that seems to be a pretty common pathway for people to get into these sorts of public interest jobs. Um, how does one get a job on the Hill? Like, what's what, what, what is that process? I, I've honestly never actually so, learned this, so I'm kind of curious um, what it looks like. So in my case, it was a professor emailing me. Uh, professor Tushin emailed me. I been in her trademark and her copyright class previously. And she said, hey, there's this committee forming on the Hill. They're looking for students who might be able to be law clerks uh, during a semester. Would you be interested? And I said, yeah, sure. That sounds fun. Um, I was a 3L. I, sure, why not? And I wound up really liking it. They liked me. It was a really good office. So I stayed on after I graduated until they basically said, yeah, we can't hire you because this was 2012 and nobody was allowed, there was a budget freeze and nobody was allowed to do anything. But my former chief counsel, who's now at the FTC, uh, Alvaro Bedoya, had been at Wilmer Hale before he went to Senator Franken's office and said, I can at least send your resume over there. He sent it to the privacy person there and the pat person there that he knew, but he misspelled the privacy person's email address accidentally. 
Uh, it was John Nectarline, whose name is not super easy to spell, so I understood. And he never saw it, but I got an interview with uh, the patent side of things and went and worked at a firm doing litigation and prosecution and counseling for about five years before saying it's time to go back to policy and not be at a large law firm anymore. Um, <laughs> Fascinating how these 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 unexpected things um, end up having having such an influence on your career because I mean you you yeah. managed to carve such an interesting niche doing patent policy <laughs> just because of a typo. So <laughs> I, um, it makes me laugh every time. I could have been talking uh, about privacy instead. Um, <laughs> on, on but I, I think area, but... <laughs> in terms of getting into it, I think one thing to look at is the Senate side. There is something called the Senate Employment Bulletin, which is a public website that you can look at. They also post for law clerks there typically. Um, so if it's an opportunity you're interested in, go look and see if there's a member who you'd want to work for, especially if it's you know your home state member or whatever. If you want to be involved in something like patents, it, you probably want to work for a judiciary member. If you want to be involved in privacy, um, depending on what sides of it, it might be judiciary, it might be commerce. So you have to do a little bit of work on figuring out who would be a good place to work for both from the uh, what issues their jurisdiction will cover, but also from a sort of personal agreement space. It's a lot easier to work for somebody if you tend to align with their policy beliefs in general. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely. I would have a, a very hard time working for some senators because I would just be telling them, no, no, you're wrong all the time. And that's not a good working relationship. Uh, sure. But yeah. that's the, the starting point for Senate employment if you don't, you know, those are the sort of public postings. There's always the, if you know somebody in the office or somebody in the office went to your school, you can always talk to them, ask if they're interested in interns. Um, sadly, a lot of them do not pay their interns, which I know is not great, but um, it's the, the world. Outside, there is a newsletter, an email newsletter you can sign up for that's very similar. The Senate one is on a website, so it's a little easier. The House one, you have to actually sign up for the email. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other avenues are things like the um, coming in through the public interest side, doing a, an internship or a, a summer clerkship at an organization like CCIA. We do have, uh, we have a couple of law fellows right now, so we are always looking. I can tell you, go look at our website. There's information about being a, an intern for us, and I think it's a good organization, or I probably wouldn't have been here for <laughs> coming on six years now. Um, so those are our ways to approach getting into this space as well. I think it's really helpful as you look for a job. It, it is really helpful to have had some sort of policy experience. It doesn't even necessarily have to be, you know, uh, I had a patent policy job if you want to go into patent policy, but having a policy job and having some understanding of the interplay between the administration and the Hill and the agencies and private practice, how all of these come together even if it's in a totally different field, I think is really valuable because you can say, look, I, yeah, I worked on privacy, but I know how the Hill works and I've been, I'm interested in patents. So I'd like to move into a patent policy job and that's a, a route as well. Yeah. And you talked a little bit about just, you know, kind of knowing what the, you know, how much time a staffer has to work on things, kind of knowing um, what they're, what they're going to be able to do, kind of what they're, you know, how many issues that they're juggling at the same time. So, you know, that sort of experience must be really valuable. Um, so yeah. let's get to some of the questions that are in the, in the chat. These are, yeah. you know, so we've got one question about the, the VLSI Intel, um, open sky, open sky petition. Um, Kelly is asking about, you know, how that might impact, um, further petitions that try to kind of tag along onto, um, that, that, that yeah. tried to tag along onto previously filed petitions. So I think that it does not create a problem. Um, I, in particular, I'm thinking here, there is no evidence that VLS, uh, sorry, that Intel and OpenSky worked together. If there was evidence of sort of the petitioner having a connection to the um, previously denied entity, that would come into sort of the real party and interest inquiry, and that would justify denial. So you're not going to see people start um, pushing third parties to file on their behalf. So I don't think there's sort of a, an encouragement of bad behavior from that side of things. And to the extent that you have patents that were denied under Fintiv and a third party comes and resurrects that petition and the PTO institutes it, that's good. That's not a bad thing. We want that to happen. Those, you know, if the PTO is saying these patents probably aren't valid, 
um, they shouldn't stay in force. It's it, the bad behavior there is leaving it in force. So I think um, I, I'm not really worried. They can't, uh, and the petitioner themselves, so like Intel couldn't go to the PTO and ask for a review of their previous petition um, for two reasons. One, they are time barred. You can only file a petition within a year of suit. So it's been more than a year since they were sued. They cannot file a new petition. And if there's no petition to join, they can't, there's no avenue for asking for a review. Which means that the only way you get to this between the real party and interest issue and the time bar issue and the joinder issue is if a genuine third party pushes the petition and pays the filing fee and moves forward with that, then you can join, but you still aren't going to be in the lead on it. You're just part of it. The only way you get into the lead is if the petitioner is abusing things. So it could create bad behavior if somebody was really willing to engage in like literally illegal and unethical behavior, but I don't think that that's the the standard we should apply. Um, I think that it's important that these patents do see review if they should be reviewed. Uh, sure. So um, Amanda's had her hand up for uh, for a while. So do you want to go ahead with your question, Amanda? Yes, thank you. Um, I was interested, um, you were talking about SEPs earlier. I was wondering what you thought of IEEE's proposed updates to its patent policy in regard to SEPs. Um, I'm not a huge fan of them, but I don't think they're the end of the world either, if that makes sense. They, so for those who don't know, about uh, seven years ago, the IEEE updated its patent policy and said uh, two things in particular. One, that injunctions are basically strongly disfavored. And two, that in analyzing the correct royalty rate, there are certain factors that should be included. One of those being the uh, sort of value of the smallest saleable patent practicing unit. I don't think, I don't recall if they use those exact terms, but that was what they were referring to. In the update, which came out uh, a couple weeks ago and goes into effect starting January 1st of 2023, they didn't eliminate those, but they backed off a little bit. Injunctive relief is still disfavored, but it maybe is a little more available under the IEEE policy. Those factors that they said should be considered are now optional, but they are still listed out formally as these are factors that optionally can be considered. So I think in practice, it's um, I think it's not an improvement from a policy ground, but it's also not a huge change except insofar as this is maybe a little more relevant in uh, jurisdictions like Germany that are a little bit more um, <laughs> pro-injunction, I would say. The, the German courts are generally recognized as being very injunction happy. It is very hard not to get an injunction in a patent case in Germany. Um, and the way they've interpreted SEP disputes, I think this maybe gives them a little bit of room on IEEE patents to, or patents that are relevant to IEEE standard. Uh, this gives them a little more room to say, oh no, putting an injunction here doesn't violate the policy. On the other hand, I think that the German courts were going to grant those injunctions anyway, so I don't know that it matters. Uh, thanks. Yeah, that's um, you know I think that SEPs are a, are a fascinating topic, and that we could spend a lot of time um, talking about, uh, particularly with the the sort of role of the the private standard setting organizations, how those in, um, <coughs> interact with the with the courts and with with legislative processes. Um, Bill has a question about the uh, the the patent eligibility debates and kind of the the big tech versus biopharma framing of of that debate. Now I've got a couple of thoughts about that. But you know, Josh, you you're you you obviously were kind of in the in the technology firm space. Kind of what, what what's your take on on how that debate has been going and whether or not this is the right framing of things? So I think that it is a useful framing. It's not a hundred percent correct. There are people who are who I would say are big tech who are more on the other side of things. I'm thinking companies like Qualcomm. And there are biopharma companies that are more on the big tech side of things. I'm thinking of particularly generic companies here. So I think that there is some, um, the categories are not quite uh, perfect. There is over and under inclusiveness. At the same time, I do think that in general, it is sort of a tech versus pharma um, debate. 
And it's, I think ultimately it comes down to the very different characteristic of patents in those two spaces. Even the most valuable drugs, you're talking, you know, looking at um, IMAX reports, you're talking maybe a couple hundred patent applications, maybe like 20 to 30 patents total, each one of which might be worth billions of dollars of drug sales. In the tech space, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of patents, none of which are probably worth all that much individually, but the aggregate impact is very high. And that creates very different concerns. The, the tech side, it's um, a lot of it is like, there's just a lot of patents that shouldn't have been issued. How do we deal with efficiently invalidating them? On the biopharma side, it's these are patents that are going to hold up much better because they spent, you know, a tech patent you might write out in 15 hours and prosecute quickly, and the examiner is probably not spending a ton of time on it either. A pharma patent is going to have had a lot more time and money put into it up front because they tend to be more valuable at the uh, at the other side when they go onto a, a drug that goes onto the market. Um, so I think that is a, a large part of, yeah, I think you can generally understand a lot of what's going on just by looking at how a given change would impact those two very different spaces. Uh, there's also, you know, there's some things about how we treat pharma patents that are treated differently from tech patents, I think, in a problematic way, especially in the 112 realm, where pharma and chemistry get this sort of, oh, it's unpredictable, you can't know anything about how things are going to happen. And technology, it's, oh yeah, this is totally predictable. Everybody could have understood that. When the reality is that there's a lot of uh, predictability in pharma and a lot of unpredictability in tech, and maybe they are being treated differently, not for um, valid doctrinal reasons necessarily, but because they provide a way to deal with these very different spaces in, um, in how they use patents. But at the same time, importing some of the requirements from pharma into the tech side might help with some of these low quality patents. In particular, I'm thinking of enablement where in the pharma side, again, things are considered unpredictable. So you really have to describe more about what you're doing. Maybe not enough. Um, there's a lot of empirical work out there that even on the pharma side, which I would say is better on this front, disclosures are not enough to recreate the invention in many cases, but they're better. If you put that on the tech side where frequently patents don't disclose anything about how you do this, that putting in an enablement requirement, right now the federal circuit says, ah, you know, this is all predictable. An engineer faced with the, this is what the claim is, could do this. I don't think that's necessarily true. And I think that bringing in that doctrine might help with some of these low quality patents. So I think that there's a sort of a, a split in how the subject matter is treated that is not a positive that is actually a negative, even though these systems are very different in how they operate. Uh, another example would be just on the obviousness side, you have all of this concern over evergreening and product hopping and minor changes to drugs, while raising the obviousness standard to combat those problems on the drug side for drug pricing reasons and others, raising those standards on the tech side would also help a lot with this sort of, yeah, it, Engineers are creative people. The yeah, you know, one of the nicest things about my my former job at a firm was occasionally I got to talk to the engineers and hear about what they actually did from the people who do it. And sometimes these were like, I got some time with um, the leads on a chip design, like a not just a chip design, but a pro, uh, a process design team. So some of the people working on the next you know generation of chips on bringing down the number of nanometers and hearing about what they were doing, they do really hard things. And it's not clear to me why they should be considered less creative than, yeah, you know, that they should be considered uncreative. Like engineers are creative people. They can think of new things. And not all of those should be patented. Some of those are just ordinary engineering. Yeah, so, it, you know, I think it's interesting. It's, it's an interesting insight that you've, you've brought up, the sort of, um, the sort of historical differences, but also um, the, the sort of differences in narrative about pharmaceutical innovation versus innovation in the technology center uh, and, and the, in the sort of computer technology arts, which have led to these very different practices and how patents end up being used um, sort of in the industry. Um, Amanda, do you, have a, do you have an additional question you want to ask? 
Um, yes, because you were talking about pharma patents a little bit um, and um, evergreening, and it kind of jogged my memory about some of the other, you know, what I consider anti-competitive practices, um, like patent thickets. I know there was a case out of the, I don't know if it was the Fifth or Ninth Circuit um, about um, about patent tickets, and the judge ended up not classifying that as anti-competitive. In your opinion, is that something that needs to be changed legislatively to stop practices like that from going on, or do you think another challenge, if it was brought um, to an appellate court, um, that it might have a different outcome? And so, just so, so just just okay. before you begin, um, we'll have actually our next session will be um, um, two folks who work in the sort of access to medicine and um, drug patent space. So you know, I think we'll have a really great discussion of that. But Josh, you deal a lot with patent tickets in the software space too, right? Yeah, I mean, I think you can think of those you know, two hundred and fifty thousand patents on a smartphone as effectively a thicket. Um, we see it more sort of in the SEP portfolio space, I think. And there was actually. Um, there have been a couple lawsuits arguing about whether acquisition of large patent portfolios can be considered in the tech side can be considered anti-competitive that I think are analogous to the, the case. I think there was a pharma case that made similar arguments and I think Humira and maybe some other drugs, but we've seen these with um, Intel and Fortress and also with Continental and Avanci, which is a patent pool. Um, so I think that there is some commonality. I, I think you'll hear next week a lot more about this, but um, I think that it needs a change in competition law, whether that come through legislation or a rethinking of how the court has interpreted the legislation we have. I don't know, but the current state of competition law, I think, does not leave a lot of space for those sorts of claims, even if it probably should be part of competition law. Um, you know, even even more reason for us to to try to bring in some some more folks who work in the competition space um, yeah. to be talking about patent policy. So, you know, I think it's just really important that organizations who focus on these sorts of issues um, have a seat at the table when it's uh, when it comes to when it comes to patent patent questions. Um, so, unfortunately, I would love to keep this conversation going, uh, but this has just been you know this has been really really delightful. Um, so, thank you, Josh, for bringing your perspective yeah. and your experience on. On these issues, yeah. Um, Thanks for having me, and I will uh, note for particularly for the law students in your office in your uh, audience. Um, I I make this offer freely. If you're interested in talking more, reach out to me. I'm more than happy to sit down for coffee or a 15 minute Zoom or whatever, and talk a little more about any of these issues. Um, and from my experience, the other folks in patent policy tend to be pretty friendly as well. So talk to them. You know, if there's something you're interested in, talk to them. Talk to me, talk to them. And, <laughs> um, yeah. Definitely. Like it's, it's a cool field. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, I, I've always enjoyed, um, you know, my opportunities to talk with, um, to talk with folks who are interested in this field as well. Um, so yeah, definitely feel free to, to reach out to any of us. Um, just um, to reiterate, our next week's session will feature uh, Zane Rizvi from Public Citizen and Matt Lane from Insight uh, Public Affairs, both of whom work on uh, drug price and access to medicine issues in the patent space. So you know, I think that that'll be another fascinating and really interesting perspective perspective um, on stakeholders in the patents and the public interest space. Uh, thank you everybody for joining and hopefully we'll all see you we'll, we'll see you next week. Thanks again for having me. All right thanks everyone.